I'm Don Holden at the Art Students League of New York. Once again, we're in the studio where Robert Beverly Hale taught figure drawing and artistic anatomy. You're now going to see lecture number eight on the hand. Tonight, we're going to take up the lower arm and the hand, though we've already touched on the lower arm. But we'll first do the hand, because when you understand how the hand moves, then you understand the masses up here. In other words, function makes form. Uh, first of all, the most important thing in the hand for an artist would be the shape of the bones. The hand is hard like the head. The most important thing in the head for an artist is the shape of the skull. Anything hard, you have to know the shape of the bones. Uh, so we'll try to learn the shapes of the bones. Then we'll learn the short muscles on the hand. You have, for instance, a muscle that spirals around here and goes into the little finger. When you pull on it, pulls out the little finger. Abducts, as the artist says. Or the doctor, I mean. Another one here, very important, egg-like shape. Pulls out the uh, index finger and others. Then finally we'll take up the muscles of the arm down here that goes in, they go into strings you see, or tendons. And uh, there's a big group, we put them together by groups. A big group comes off here and send in ten sends tendons in here. And if you pull on the muscles they flex the hand, or if you get the right one it'll flex your fingers, you see. The same is true of the back. These things come off the condyles. You pull on the group, it'll extend the hand. You can get a hold of the right muscle, it will extend the fingers. Then there are a few little fellows that come down the arm and extend the thumb like that. Or frankly, abduct it, they would say. So let's try to get a feel of the shapes of the bones of the hands. Remember, our problem in illusionary drawing is very greatly trying to think of the shape before we draw it, having con some conception of the shape of everything we draw. Of course, we can't do that unless we know the shape exists, you see. And uh, that's where the layman suffers terribly when he starts to draw, because, of course, he only knows a few popular bumps on the body, you can see. Uh, well, we might start drawing on this uh, radius. Let's do the right hand. and We'll come down the radius and uh, it opens up and proceeds to create a articulation that will hold the hand. Uh, for the artist, the owner, the other bone is uh, really has very little to do with the hand. Now, we're drawing the palm side. This sort of a, uh, a hand. So I've got it right. I haven't, no, I got it wrong. I'm drawing the left hand. Well. <laughs> you see the radius is here. We come down the radius here. On this side. It might make it bigger anyway, it'll be clearer. And there's the cavity that holds the hand. And next to it is the ulna. There's that nice bump on the end that I think you're all familiar with. And you see it touches the radius. There's an articulation there. Now, when we look at the hand, we find it's made up of the carpus, which is this group of bones here. The bones beyond the carpus, which are called the metacarpal bones. And remember, this is the metacarpal of the thumb. And finally, the 
uh, the uh, phalanges. There are only two on the thumb, just like the big toe. Uh, one could think of all kinds of mass conceptions for the hand. Uh, there's a nice one, but it applies to the, the closed hand. You know your hand gets much wider when you spread your fingers. You see, your hand isn't much wider than two eyes when it's that way, but the minute you spread your fingers, it takes on about, oh, almost half an eye more. People are very surprised by the fact that the hand is so small across here. Uh, there's a famous measurement of the hand among art students. That is, it reaches from the, from the chin to the widow's peak. Uh, well, that's supposed to be six eyes. But then another famous idea among art students is that your fist will reach from the nose to your chin. Well, that would be two eyes, you see. Well, of course, we all vary a touch, but those are the reasonable, uh, those are reasonable averages. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we could put a carpus in here. Uh, we'd have to make it quite shallow. And notice I'm drawing the hand in the way it normally falls in this position. You see how your angles break just normally there? You see, begin to make the whole arm straight. But a professional is very aware of how the hand, the arm comes down here, and then goes out, and then the hand goes back. It's that old rule on, in figure drawing. As you move from form to form, you change direction, you see. Uh, now, we can't split this thing with a line. It should be in the middle. <coughs> that probably wouldn't come out so far. Uh, should be in the middle. And the nice thing about that is that the metacarpal of the little finger, if the middle metacarpal of the little finger, which is uh, firmly attached to the carpus, will run along that line. Uh, and the, uh, all these metacarpals and metatarsals, the basic shape, and we have to have shape conceptions, would be a box and a rod and a ball. Then you refine that for years, perhaps. And then another thing is that if you double the carpus, you'll get to the end of the middle finger. Uh, that means that's about an eye long, you see. Uh, and we get our box and our rod. And uh, finally, the ball, which uh, is very much on the palm side of the hand. The uh, index finger is also stuck to the carpus. <coughs> and uh, you find you can't move it without moving the carpus. But these other two are very different. Uh, the third is, uh, is quite flexible here. a touch shorter. And uh, the little finger is famous because a big bump on the end like that of the little toe. Now I'm spreading this hand slightly. And uh, there's a great trick in spreading hands and fi uh, spreading fingers. <coughs> uh, you take a point just here. And then you see, if you spread your fingers, you take straight lines and run them this way and they'll hit the end of each finger if the hand is firmly spread. Uh, guess you get the point by experimentation. Uh, I have it from childhood, because when I was in the sixth grade or something, some terrible little boy took a fountain pen and jabbed it into my hand and made a tattoo mark there that has conveniently lasted me all my life. It seems to be just in the right place. But you can find out where it is. It's an amusing line if you can think of it as a pin going right through the hand. Because you could take points on the pin and still do the same thing for the spray. I mean, a point here on the, on the pin. If the fingers are down, you've got the, uh, the right direction. In, in other words, you'll see me now, I'm spreading my hand. The point is about here, you see. Uh, the fingers will go along these lines. Uh, the thumb will do the same.
Well, the body of the hand is supposed to be the same length as the index finger. See, if I measure the body of my hand and then the index finger, they seem to be about the same. Now, that's a fairly normal idea. So we know that the end of the index finger uh, should be about here. And uh, each one of these bones is about three-fourths the length of the one before. <coughs> Although it's not quite true on the last two, they're a little more equal. And the last phalange has the arrowhead that both the fingers and the toes have that support the nails, you know, on the other side. The uh, index is a touch shorter. You know, artists get this feeling of curves here. I don't, I don't know there are any real rules about it. That's a little low, I think. Uh, but the index is just a touch shorter. <coughs> And uh, then these two are allowed to be very much the same size at the end of the hand, you see. So I could be pretty sure that uh, taking that, my width line, the other one will end about here. <coughs> uh, we'll talk much more about these little phalanges when we get to the, uh, when we get to the uh, bones themselves, the fingers. Now the uh, metacarpal of the thumb, of course, comes off the carpus in its own peculiar way we we'll talk about. And uh, I don't know, the, the artist has a great feeling that, that this joint here is about equal to this one here. He likes to draw a circle there, you see. This one here and this one here. Um, so you, uh, you get your second phalange about here. Uh, first phalange and the second with the arrowhead. Uh, this carpus is full of bones and takes a lot of study if you want to get it very exactly. But uh, most artists just think of it as a quarter of an apple with the skin side on the back. Even Raphael seems to do that. Uh, there are little details I'll try to point out that we can learn, especially perhaps on the palm side. Uh, well, we have to, uh, I don't know that I have to run over those terms again. That's the radius, the ulna, the carpus, the metacarpal bones, and the phalanges, or fingers we call them. Uh, we have to think about the fact that we all came from the sea and that our tears are salt and our sweat is salt and we have webbed hands and webbed feet like sea animals. <coughs> and it comes as a surprise to people to know the webbing comes way down these fingers, halfway down. You see, people often draw as if the finger started here, but they don't because of the webbing. Uh, that causes quite a little uh, uh, confusion in the beginning, because you think the body of the hand is that long, you know, because you see the webbing there. But actually, you see, when you close your fist, you find that you've made a mistake. Uh, you have to realize that all of this in here is, is finger, actually, because of that webbing which we get from the sea. Uh, the webbing on this joint runs from here to there. Uh, let's take a back view, because in the back view we'll have to think a little more about the bones, because if you feel the back of your hand, they're coming right through the skin, and uh, you almost draw them when you draw the back of the hand. So we can come down on a radius, <coughs> Open it out. 
They put the elder next to it. And now we will take in a little detail, a little styloid process on the back of this prominent bump we uh, feel here. You see, the end of the ulna always shows as a bump at the end of the arm. The, uh, the carpus sits in here like a quarter of an apple, the flesh side. Probably about an eye long that way. And if we can get the center line or on the back uh, and double the carpus, we'll know about where that middle finger uh, metacarpal starts. So we, uh, notice that I put the, uh, uh, the bone over to the right of this line. Uh, now that we're on the back of the hand, the ball is not at all prominent, it's underneath. It's underneath there. Here's the metacarpal of the index, which is mortised, as they like to say, to the hand, that means securely fastened. You see, that's the back we're doing. And I drew this metacarpal, and I drew that one, and the carpus, and that's all one solid piece. Uh, that's why some uh, people say the hand is something like a bird. This is the body. But we can move the wings on each side, you see. Uh, you see, there's a lot of movement in this metacarpal here, up against the carpus, and a lot here. Uh, if we spread the hands, the spreading is all done through these metacarpals. Uh, people like to say that the hand is so flat you can sort of hold the horizon of the earth, but it's so curved that it can hold an egg. And the reason is just the movement of those metacarpals in there. Uh, we have to think of that in relation to the foot too, because the same thing goes on. So here's the metacarpal of the uh, fourth, or ring finger, uh, they call it enthusiastically, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> the ball very much on the bottom. And then the metacarpal of the uh, uh, little finger, the big bump there, that's one of our landmarks. <coughs> uh, it's shorter still. And the thumb uh, comes out of here, metacarpal of the thumb. Again, we can take this same point, you see, and spread the hand. I'm drawing it as if it was spread. <coughs> Just so you won't get mixed up, this is the palm. This is the back. Uh, right away we can get the length of the uh, middle finger, it'll be twice the uh, body of the hand. You see, this is what they call the body of the hand. Artists are very conscious of it. Carpus and metacarpus. They make a mass of it always when they draw it in their minds. Uh, the uh, First joint, as I say, about one, two-thirds the previous. A little more equal on the end there. Here's the index. You see, this is the real width line of the hand, just the way that is. And we can use that width line and get an idea of where the next finger will come. <coughs> uh, the little finger, oh, some people say it's about as long as the metacarpal. In other words, that and that are supposed to be about equal. I don't know how true that is. I've heard it said. Let's try it out on the skeleton. Doesn't look true at all here. I don't think that's a very good rule. 
Uh, well, again, of course, we have the webbing on the back. Oh, we got, we got to put a few bones on here. <coughs> A uh, little arrowhead. The webbing naturally is way down the fingers, you see. I run from that joint to that joint. And help makes the skeleton look like a hand. Now, on the back of the hand, there are very curious little lines on the bones that artists study. Uh, there are little curved lines that run like this on the back of each bone. And the thing about them is the space between them is flat. Uh, on the uh, metacarpal of the index here, the the bone has a little spiral quality. It's a very, that's a very famous line, that one is. And uh, the reason is that when you mass up the body of the hand, that line is the real edge. That's the edge where the major light planes meet. And to find an anatomical line where the major light planes meet is very rare on this human body. Uh, the line where major light planes may usually exist in the artist's imagination. And that's why primitives and beginners can never, can, can never draw it. Uh, uh, this line here is often thought of as one. The line in the angle of the ribs is one. But they're very hard to find. But there are little subtle ones like these two lines here, that one and that one, which are very evidently the edge of the body of the hand. That is, if I, if I light this with two lights and throw a great light from here, it won't be able to get beyond that line, you see, and light up the other side. Uh, 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 one of the great mistakes, it's awfully hard to explain, one of the great mistakes beginners made is, is not to realize that artists break their planes with their mind, not with their eyes. And uh, beginners are always breaking their planes on very peculiar places. Their major planes like the, say, the edge of rectus abdominis. They'll say all of that is front plane and the rest is side. And things of that sort. But it just won't work. It has to be an intellectual process, this breaking of form into two planes with two lights that are created by the artist. <coughs> The uh, uh, knife edge of the tibia is one of these breaks where the uh, major plane often meet. The tendon of tibialis antiochus they often meet on. But very seldom do they meet on, a, uh, on an anatomical line. Well, there are your hands. I think you know what the movement is. You can... Uh, you can... Uh, abduct it or adduct it and flex it, extend it, but you can't rotate it. You see, if you hold the radius, you can't rotate your hand. The uh, rotation is done, as we said last time, in this peculiar way of the radius carrying the hand over the ulna. You see, the radius is a rotating bone and it rotates over the ulna. Uh, this ulna here can be in any, any position. But the radius can still do its stuff, you see. But of course, there have to be muscles to do that. And they, of course, make up a lot of the form of the lower arm. But what we're going into are the short muscles first that have such an influence on the hand itself. Uh, well, I was talking about one that pulled out the little finger, but I think maybe before we do that, we might draw some other views of the hand so we can get a better idea of the feel of the bones. Uh, let's, uh, let's draw this view of the right hand. 
uh, we'll find that we can put the body now very conveniently in, uh, in uh, three cubes. All about an eye's uh, height, width, and length. And the, uh, the coppice, which is really a quarter of an apple, doesn't quite come to the bottom of that cube. Uh, the metacarpal of the middle finger has a slight rise to the top, you see. And the uh, ball is on the bottom. And the metacarpal of the next is very much the same except it doesn't quite come down so far. It's a box and a rod and a ball in your original invention. Now, what is very hard to get is the amount of rotation on that thumb. How does it come out of the hand? Uh, I think the solution is to study this joint. Uh, this, again, is a ball and saddle joint. And that's something like a saddle on a spool. The saddle is on the thumb end. And if you can get the position of the spool, and then you can get the rotation of that joint. Uh, and the spool here, uh, and the spool is about here, it comes out of the bone there, and is in more or less that position, you see. And the saddle has to bite it, so the thumb comes off. Uh, about that way. <clears throat> well, just place that spool in your mind and then you can feel the amount of rotation on that, uh, on that difficult thumb. You see, it's looking, uh, it's looking this way. It doesn't looking this way or anything like that. Now, I find the books say there's, there's no actual rotation in the thumb, but it's a lie. Uh, certainly if I do that, my thumb is looking this way. If I do that, it is looking that way. It may have to do with the looseness of the joint, but there is a certain amount of rotation in that thumb for the fastidious. I don't think it makes much difference. Well, I suppose we'd see underneath there. I don't know that we could. Uh, I don't believe we could, no. We'd see the bones now coming off. And uh, they too, you see, they have a bump and a rise. And another bump. And a bump. A rise. And another bump. And the last one goes up a little. Uh, Uh, what's the great mistake is draw them this way. You know, people do that very gaily, concave to the top on the, on the uh, straight profile. Uh, the strange thing is, on the three-fourths, they are concave, but not on the profile. Uh, you have to remember that uh, the top of the finger is really bone, and the top of the hand is very much bone. Uh, I, I forgot to say on the back of the hand that these lines I drew here, uh, they enclose a flat space. Uh, so the back of the hand is very flat. Uh, I think the reason for that is that everybody thinks these tendons here are ropes or strings, uh, but actually they're rather tape-like. And uh, if you look at them carefully, they move very easily across the back of the hand. And it would have to be flat for them to do that. <coughs> Well, that'd be a middle finger here, which would be just a touch longer. Uh, but I, I think the, uh, the secret of all this is to remember that those bones are a bump and a concave to the uh, convex to the top, and then a bump and a convex to the top. Unless you get over to the three-fourths view, the thing to do is look at them at the skeleton and see what happens to them because the, the finger takes on their character enormously on the outline. Uh, well, let's try this view. Again, we can box up the body nicely. <coughs> About uh, three cubes would do it.
and the coppice will come about to there. And now we'll see the middle finger that will rise, rise the other end. And the next finger coming down slightly. And then the next one with big bump like the uh, little toe, probably about to there. And we can take these fingers off. <coughs> Now, of course, on this side, <coughs> you see the, uh, the radius. The uh, radius moves up, you see, and, and turns into a sort of a lozenge shape here and holds that hand. Uh, you might see the ulna behind, but not very much of it. Uh, uh, the curious thing about this hand is that this is the carpus here, as it is there. But if I do this, this is the carpus here. In other words, the arrangement seems to be something like this, that, uh, uh, that if I throw the, uh, the hand down a bit, uh, we, get a, uh, we get the carpus there, you see. But if, on the other hand, uh, I decide I'll, I'll throw the hand way up. Uh, we can almost think of the body as egg-like. And we'll, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll feel the influence of the carpus there. You see, there it is, big bump. Of course, another saddle joint you're dealing with, of a sort. Well, now I think we might put in a few uh, short muscles. There are very few we uh, art students have to learn. There is, for instance, the one I said, uh, pull the little finger out. Uh, on this front view here, it uh, rises about here and spirals around the, the uh, bone and goes into the side of the little finger so that it can it can abduct it, they would say. Uh, you see, abduction, they think of the hand as a unit, so that would be abduction, and that would be an abduction of the thumb. Uh, well, the thing to do is trace that muscle through on the other views and see its influence. And trace them all, as a matter of fact. Uh, here, uh, this is the back view, you see. It'll stick out here a little. How much? The abductor of the little finger. <coughs> of course, on this inner view, uh, here's our carpus here, it will have an enormous influence. It'll be all that. It'll go up to that line we were talking about. <coughs> Well, the abductor of the index really makes a skeleton look like a hand. It's among artists a very famous egg-shaped mass. And uh, it, uh, it lies in here. Uh, let's get to the back side. It lies in here. It's a muscle like that. It runs right up against the line we're talking of. Uh, it has an attachment to the thumb that doesn't seem to have much influence on the thumb. And the little tendon uh, goes into the side of the of the index there, and of course pulls it out like that. Uh, that's the abductor of the index. Uh, some of your books will call it one of the interossi, but uh, I think that's much better for art students to think of it as the abductor of the index. Uh, on the palm side, we can't see it. Uh, but you know, there are similar muscles like these in between these spaces here that art students don't study uh, because they're deep and you know, they don't seem to affect the form. Uh, but you can see what they do. Uh, uh, they're the ones that enable you to move your finger backward and forth like that, you see. 
and they fill up the space between the bones and they're called the interossi. And it's evident that uh, this one and that one are just part of that group really. Now, we have here a very uh, peculiar muscle, it's very deep, that runs from the, uh, this is the palm, remember, runs from the metatarsal of the, uh, metacarpal of the thumb, right across, very deep, to the uh, middle bone there. And what it does is to pull the thumb that way. Well now, wrinkles form across the pull of muscles. And that one is particularly famous because that creates your lifeline, you see. That's why you have a lifeline on account of that muscle. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I was going to say that uh, you could always combine the study of the hand with fortune telling, you know. Uh, we artists use the same lines they do. And uh, then you'll always have a little career on the side, you know, to keep you in paints and canvas. Uh, uh, well, you look at your lifeline carefully, and uh, uh, where is it? It's about like this. I think it goes up to the outside of that bone there. But incidentally, there is a landmark here. Uh, we call it the head of the scaphoid. And uh, I think you can feel it, but I was very aware of it. And uh, the uh, lifeline like, likes to start on that and moves around like this, you see. It, uh, it'll tell you how old you are if you take a, a point about here, you see. That, that would be about 50. Well, that's about 25, that's 75, and that's about 100. So just one glance you can tell how long you're going to live, you see. Uh, there's a a wonderful story written by Max Beerbohm, the Englishman, about a group of people who were in a train, and there was a fortune teller in the train. And he began to tell everybody's fortunes. And he saw that they were all going to die on the same day. And he thought, well, there's no way that could happen unless this train is going to be wrecked and everybody killed. But he said, I'm not going to take part in that. So he pulled the emergency cord, train stopped and he got cut off you see and then the train went on it was a terrible wreck and everybody was killed <laughs> there you are you see. <laughs> so it pays to study these things you know? <laughs> there's a very curious muscle here and anatomists really don't know uh, why it's there Little fibers run this way, but it, uh, it's called the short muscle of the palm. It's more or less embedded in the skin. And uh, there are lots of theories about it. One is it helped primitive man to cup his hand when he wanted to drink water and things like that. But it's, uh, it's found on very few animals. But for us, it makes a big bump, you see, there. In other words, when we think of the body of the hand, and you know this is it, uh, we think of a either squared up form, or I think perhaps more often a form like that. And we find, you see, there's a bump on each corner. There's a great bump there. Uh, frankly, there's a bump here too. Uh, but it comes from the actual bulging of the bone there. Uh, there's a bump here too. Uh, but it comes from the bulging of that bone. Fortune tellers call this business leadership. That bump there is very large. I can't think of any reason except if you worry so much about your business you get a little arthritis, it gets a little larger, but uh, that might be the reason. Uh, uh, there is a muscle that starts there, as a matter of fact it's a group of three, and they run up to this joint and bend it, you see. They. Uh, I think it overtakes the outline a little bit on this view. Uh, it runs up to that joint and bends it. It's a group of three muscles. And they'd be uh, in the books pretty much the abductor of the first phalange. 
<coughs> but the fortune tellers call that the the uh, bound of love, you see, if you have that strongly developed, you're very attractive to the opposite sex. There's no doubt about it. Except if you think your way around it, you just exercise it a little, you see. Uh, we get larger, 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 and it might not change your position in, uh, in your particular world. Maybe thumbing cows, milking cows would improve that. Uh, uh, there are very, uh, you ought to look at it a good deal. When you bend it, you get very interesting wrinkles across here that are used by artists. <coughs> so, you see on the body of the hand, we, we more or less feel a one, two, three, four bumps that are quite uh, clear. Now, as I say, these bustles can all be transferred from these diagrams to the other ones. If I take this here, you see, not only do you become familiar, perhaps, with the bump of the scaphoid, Oh, oh, no, that's the wrong side. Where am I? Uh, oh, no, it's not the wrong side. No, that's another one. Another landmark here. That's, that's the most famous, I think. Uh, a little further out, perhaps. Uh, that's what they call the pisiform bone, or the pea-like bone. And it has good reasons for being a landmark. The main one is that this tendon goes directly for it. And, uh, and uh, it would come down here a bit, you see, and uh, we feel this bump starting right off from it, you see. So if you look at your hand, you get those two clear bumps there. Uh, and this one, too, will start off there. Uh, on the uh, thumb side, we, we think of the scaphoid. And uh, since this muscle has a tendency to come from there, you see, that's why you get that fullness there. Uh, similarly, we can take this muscle and fill up this space here, you see, with that uh, nice egg-shaped muscle. Uh, that's the abductor of the index. Well, I do believe those are the short muscles as art students are taught them. And I think we ought to have a little recess and then we come back and attack the long ones and their tendons. See what goes on up there. We do the right arm, and we come down on this humerus. And now I think we know what's, uh, what's underneath the humerus. A spool and a ball. And the ulna, you see, bites the spool. You got a nice hinge joint. And the ulna has a beautiful little S curve and comes down about like that with that big knob at the end. Uh, this is a front side we're doing, a palm side. And the ulna starts off large and then ends up quite small. Uh, the radius is just pushed up against that ball as if my stick were hollowed out here and it's nothing more or less than a rotating bone. Uh, the ulna performs its hinge action, that's this one, but no matter where this ulna is, the radius can rotate around and carry the hand, you see, like that. Uh, as you get on, you're able to visualize those bones in the arm in any position in the lower arm. I think most of you know this is called supination and this is called pronation. Supination. And all medical students, as I said, all art students, say you can hold a bowl of soup that way, but you can't hold it that way, so that's supination. So. <laughs> uh. Now, 
Now, the uh, body of the hand is down here. Oh, I haven't drawn the, uh, the radius yet. The radius is just pushed up against that ball, and uh, it starts small, uh, but of course it ends quite large. And it has a place for holding the hand, you see. Uh, now we know how long the hand will be, because it'll be one-fifth the off the length of the ulna. Uh, we know that halfway down the hand will be the, the end of the body of the hand, as we call it. The carpus, the metacarpus. So uh, uh, we could, uh, no, I don't think I've quite hit it, have I? Not at all, about here. So we can fit a, uh, that sort of a shape in there. Uh, uh, we could say the carpus would be about so much. And uh, you see, we're, we're doing this. And we could get our little point and uh, get the feel of the fingers for a spread hand. Uh, we could feel the thumb of some sort and uh, a finger or so. Uh, and that, of course, would be the, uh, the palm. Now, we have to flex the hand, as they say. And we have to close the fingers. And there's a whole group of muscles we call the flexors that come off the interior condyle, which is this thing here. A uh, very famous landmark, this thing here, you see. And they belly out <coughs> on a man about halfway down the arm. And they form the flexor group. Uh, as I said last time, uh, the, the way to go after this is function. Uh, people go crazy trying to learn these muscles. As soon as you figure out what they do, it's not hard. Because anything that flexes is always called ex uh, uh, flexor something, you know, ex flexor carpi ulnaris or something like that. Now, well, uh, let's take up flexor carpi ulnaris. It's in this... Uh, in this mass here, but the artist hardly distinguishes it from the other. But he's very aware of the tendon that comes down and goes into our landmark, you see, which is the pisiform bone. Uh, that's one of the great lines in the business. Because that, of course, is this uh, sharp edge here. And that, of course, is an anatomical uh, line where the major light planes meet, you see, again. And there aren't many of them, I show you. Uh, that's called the flexor of the carpus on the side of the ulna. Flexor carpi ulnaris, they say. Uh, because nowadays, in their last meeting, the anatomists decided they'd make every anatomical term a Latin term. Every one of them. Uh, but we art students, we lag behind a bit. Uh, on the other side is another flexor buried in there, and uh, uh, that uh, heads towards the scaphoid bump. And uh, that's very famous among doctors, that one. That's flexor copy radialis. Uh, the reason it's famous among doctors is that uh, if you can get your, hand, your finger on it, you can come down, you see, and then when you get to the bone, you can press. And your pulse is right there. And if you're alive, you can feel your pulse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, there you go. That's all right. <laughs> but you see, you've always noticed a doctor come down like that. And he's running down flexor copy radialis. Now, in the center is uh, one, we might say for a moment, that comes down, enters the flesh of the hand, and goes to the ends of all the fingers. Uh, but the strange thing is, in the human being, there are two of those. And what they do is go to the ends of the fingers, and if you pull on the two, they'll close your fingers, you see. Uh, now, uh, again, there's a piece of sort of phony scientific theory about that. It was thought that that little monkeys 
if they fell out of their nests, that would be the end, you see. So gradually they developed two uh, common flexes of the fingers instead of one. So if they fell out of the nest, they could hold on to a twig or a limb, you see. And you'll find to this day that if you have a newborn baby and you want to hang him on the chandelier, he'll hang there. Because he's got two common flexes of the fingers, you see. Uh, babies have very strong grips, as some of you mothers know. Uh, but uh, oddly enough, that's not the muscle we use when we draw the center of the hand. If you put your fingers together like this, you see a very strong tendon that seems to escape the binding of the flesh, the binding of the wrist. And that is called the long muscle of the palm. And that lies over the two I've just described. And uh, again, the tendon is the thing we're after, the tendon. Now, to transfer some of these thoughts over here, uh, I put in this one, which is very uh, obvious and well known, makes the corner. Uh, this one here, uh, I think you can see that function from, uh, from the drawings. You know, they can do this and this and this. And the one in the center that you can't really, the two in the center you can't really see, they come down and then they divide and they go to the ends of all the fingers, you see. Those are the common flexors of the fingers. Right down the center, the very end. That's the reason you can close your fingers. Uh, but the one the artist draws is one that's quite near this one, which overshadows those others. And all it does is just spread in the flesh of the palm. And it's called palmaris longus. You see, that little baby in there I was talking about, that's palmaris brevis, or the short one. Uh, <clears throat> now, these muscles on men, they come about halfway down, because men are short muscle. On uh, women, they're liable to come a little further down, which makes the women more graceful. You see, I've told you, I think, that we're all divided between long-muscled and short-muscled people, and variations in between. <coughs> now, if we go to the back of the hand, if we go to the back of the hand, the inner condyle will be here. That's that, you see. The inner condyle will be here. <coughs> and the outer there. And uh, we get this, this arrangement. Uh, the little spool will be here, a crazy spool that goes uphill on the bottom, you see. And that gives the ulna its uh, particular uh, direction. Uh, the ulna has a big bump on the end. This one's a little small on the other. Uh, the radius is pushed up against the ball. You can still see from the back and it comes down and opens out to make the articulation, as we say. Uh, well, just to differentiate, we might draw sort of a fist here, I guess. <coughs> a thumb coming off here. Now, this, uh, this flexor group, uh, this flexor group, of course you can see from the back. You see, you're very aware that it covers off the, uh, uh, you're very aware that it covers off the inner condyle. And of course, you'd see it from the back here, bulging out just a little, and going to the front, and embracing the bone. Embracing the bone. The facts of the group look about like that. <coughs> uh, but dominating the back of the arm is the extensor group. And it's, it's very much the same, the same idea. 
Uh, it's a group of muscles. You see, it swells out like that. Uh, <coughs> it embraces the bone quite a little. And it has in it, uh, muscles are very much the same type. It has uh, a flexor on the side of the radius that sends a tendon down that goes in the hand there. Then a flexor on the side of the ulna comes down there. And between the two of them, uh, oh, they'd be extensors, I'm so sorry. Extensors, of course. They can do that sort of thing. Uh, to put them on the big pictures, uh, uh, flex, uh, this of course is flexor carpi ulnaris. See it taking a ride over that styloid process. It really goes all the way up into that bone there. Uh, and for pretty good reason too. Uh, you see, it would come up along here. And it would have to go in about there, otherwise it couldn't pull the hand into that position. Which is what it has to do. Extensor. Uh, the other one comes down and goes into uh, a, uh, perhaps a process we ought to remember, a little bump on the back of the middle metacarpal. It shows up a good deal. Well, the rest is about what you'd expect. There's another one in the middle, the common extensor of the fingers, and uh, that comes down and it goes to the ends of all the fingers in the center there. Uh, in this diagram, uh, that great, uh, there's only one on this side. It's, uh, it's uh, quite a heavy uh, tendon there that, that branches out about here. And about here divides and goes all the way down to the ends of the fingers. Uh, but as an artist, you never see it go beyond halfway down the first phalange. Uh, of course, those tendons are used a lot by artists. You know, if you put your hand above your elbow, the veins go away. And you can see them here, you see. But you never see them much beyond here, even though they go all the way down to the bottom. And those are the common flexors of the fingers. Now, we have one more group that artists call the supinator group. <coughs> the supinator group. Uh, and it's uh, loosely named, I think, and it consists of two muscles. And it's very important in drawing, however, it's, uh, you see it on the front view. Of course, on the front view, we see this one here, you see, uh, hiding behind the bone. I better put on these what these are. That's, uh, that's the flexor, you see. The flexor group. And that's the flexor there. But this is the extensor group. Perhaps I can color the extensors green. See, this is the back view. This is palm or front view. Uh, of course, there's a furrow in here. It's quite famous. That's the ulnar furrow in between the two groups. Uh, now this great supinator grows way up the arm here. And it's, it's a group of two muscles. And it pretty much covers the green group. And uh, uh, the principal muscle sends a tendon in that uh, goes in about there. <coughs> you see, the reason it's called supinator, I'd have to see if I can get a back view in here for you, or at least get the, get the arm into uh, uh, pronation. Uh, we'll draw this same view here. <coughs> Uh, 
And we can remember all the same things. The, uh, the outlet will remain the same, you see. But the radius, you see, the, ra the, the radius can, uh, can revolve over the ulna. It doesn't do it very fully on this badly put together skeleton, much better on you. The radius, you see, can revolve all the way over the ulna. So that radius, uh, that radius can do this. Revolve right over the ulna like that. And of course we uh, now see the uh, uh, the back of a hand here. The other ones I, I go from this to that. Yeah, well, that's right, you see. Now, we have on here the uh, little uh, flexor group and the uh, deep uh, extensor group, and then the great supinator group over this. Now, you see it's been forced into a spiral. It, it principally goes into there. It's been forced into a spiral, and in order to uncoil that spiral, you see, it gives the supination movement to the arm, and that's why I just call that the supinator group. Uh, frankly, uh, uh, in this picture, you see, it, it starts way up here. Way up here, way up on the bone. And would swell out a good deal. That's supinator. Watch for that line there. That's the line between the functions, you see. Uh, and uh, one of these comes down, goes into here. And uh, uh, another one actually comes down and goes into the... Uh, uh, the uh, index, in other words, the, uh, the, uh, it's called the, it's called the uh, flexor of the corpus, flexor copy radialis, brevis, they call it, goes in there. So with those three groups, you can do about anything you want with your hands, you see. You move all your fingers, rotate it. <coughs> and uh, I would advise you, if you haven't studied much anatomy, uh, not all the books tell you to put these things together in, uh, in terms of function. <coughs> uh, but it's very wise to do, and I think that what you ought to do if you haven't studied much anatomy and you get to the really brutal problems of the lower arm, is to take uh, three different colored crayons and anything that's uh, called extensor color it one color and anything called flexor color it another and then you'll have the supinator group left over and then you can get it clearly in your mind it's not as complicated as it seems if you break them into functional groups <coughs> uh, on the back of this arm, there's a little more subtlety going on. Uh, there are some muscles that move the thumb. Their bellies are not very obvious. Uh, there are three of them. Uh, uh, like that. And uh, they're put in underneath there, and the tendon of this one comes down and goes to the base of the thumb. Uh, the uh, the real importance of that thing is that if I drew this anatomy very carefully, it would be very jagged. You see, I'd get the little scaphoid and the trapezium or tra trapezoid, whatever they call it. I'd get something like that. But if you look at your hand, you'll see this beautiful free sweep there. And uh, that's the tendon of this one that's buried in there. I guess it would be called uh, the abductor of the first phalange. Uh, it is accompanied by the second one uh, that, uh, that just follows it, except that goes in to here. And if you look at your hand carefully and move it up and down, you'll see the two, you can see the two at times. But I think most artists consider them as one, because they look a lot like one. Uh, now there's one more that goes to the end of the, uh, of the thumb here. 
<coughs> There's one more that goes to the end of the thumb, and it it uh, it comes down and it goes across here in a very crazy way, uh, in the very last phalange. And uh, if you do something like this, you see that great hollow between those tendons, between the two here and the one there. Uh, that's called a snuff box. Because in the old days, they put a little snuff there, you know, and <laughs> sniff it and get a high. Nothing but a nicotine high, actually, but... Uh, and they still do, you know. They still use uh, snuff in places where fire is very... in fireworks factories. Strange enough, in the U uh, U.S. Senate, there is snuff box about... just for old time's sake, I guess. <laughs> Now, on these uh, uh, flexors, we have to think of what they do to these lines across the hand. Of course, we always get wrinkles running across the pull of muscles. And you see on this front view here, uh, the common flexor comes down underneath there and goes to the ends of all the fingers. Now, that's going to cause lines to go across there. And we learn those lines by heart uh, because you know, any line of a form will tell people what direction the form is going and what shape it is, you see. Usually you can't see them because the model holds a fistful of shadow, you know, so you have to learn them by heart. Uh, the uh, first line uh, that... Uh, the, the first line is... Uh, uh, this... Uh, flexor group creates is that one, which is called the headline by the fortune tellers. Uh, the next one is called the heart line. Uh, it runs a good deal like that. You see, those are flexor lines and caused by the pull of the muscles. Uh, the next ones have to do with these pads on the joints. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, curious thing is the, uh, the pads don't fall where you think they ought to. Uh, for instance, you get a, a break there, you know, and a break there. You see on the, on the side view, uh, this, this, bump, this bump goes all the way up to the webbing. You see, like that. It doesn't seem as it ought to, but it does. Uh, the next break is pretty much under the, uh, the joint. Uh, the next uh, breaks a little before the joint, they like to say. But artists study their own hands to see where those things lie. Uh, there's a very curious thing about wrinkles on that, uh, that uh, 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 you always get two wrinkles here on the palm side. And as I remember, a couple here as well. But you can see how functionally those uh, wrinkles develop uh, because of the flexor muscles. Of course, there are other famous wrinkles in fortune telling and, and anatomy. Uh, on account of these muscles here, you get wrinkles across there. Uh, they call the bracelets. And the fortune tellers, heaven knows, I don't know, they say how many times you're going to get married, but there are always three. Uh, well, that's all right in the Greek Orthodox Church, but it all depends, you know. The Greeks are very sensible. They say you can get married twice, but the third time you have to stay married, because by that time you ought to know enough not to be foolish anymore. You see. Uh, But they really, uh, uh, you know, scientifically, uh, just functional breaks, uh, wrinkles across the pull of muscles, like these things here. The problem of uh, the actual draftsmanship of the hand, the drawing of the hand, uh, your real problem is the problem of the direction. Uh, you see, you have to decide on the direction of the body of the hand, of the wrist, 
and of each one of the uh, uh, phalanges. Uh, that's something like 17 directions in all, you know. And it's your responsibility to decide on them, and not make them look as they're going two ways at once, you see, any one of these directions. And that, of course, is why artists are always massing things up. You see, if I mass up my wrist like that, I know what direction it's going, uh, because of all our mass conceptions, uh, blocks will give you the, uh, the best direction. Uh, let's take a horrible hand, I thought of one like this, you know. Uh, I just figure it out. Uh, what direction is the body of the hand going, you see? Matter of fact, I think that way I'd have to mass it that way. Uh, well, it's an abduction a bit. It uh, must be a, a sort of a vague mass like this. Uh, in our minds, you see. You see, we're getting direction. Uh, this finger, we can think of it as a block or a cylinder, if we wish, going off this way. Uh, artists love to love run rings around an ideal cylinder to get those wrinkles, you know. Uh, this finger here is going three directions at once. And we'd have to stop and analyze each direction, you see. And combine them all together, something like that, I think. You know, we have to feel that, and, uh, and that, and that, and that. And I suppose this line in here would be a sort of a compromise between that and that. And this line here we'd hardly see. Uh, the, uh, the thumb, you know, runs from its point of origin here up to the other finger. Uh, we can just think of it as some sort of a of a simple mass, like that. Uh, but we ought to know its direction. We could either box it or, uh, or put circles around it. You see, putting circles around things gives them directions, gives them uh, uh, axis direction, you might say. Uh, here's another finger. Well, if we think of it simply, we can just think, well, it's about like that. And here's another coming almost at us. Uh, that's the uh, that's the sort of uh, mass layout you'd have in your mind for direction. <coughs> it's very hard to get direction without thinking some sort of mass. The uh, the rectangular form is always considered the best, but uh, cylinders have their values, especially for uh, tilt. You know, or thrust, as we call it. Now, the rest of the drawing is entirely, it seems to be memory work. It's uh, studying your hand. It's putting in the details we've been talking about. You see, you probably know that on the three-fourths that you're seeing the bone there. And uh, maybe this thing would start to show up, you see. And uh, you can go so far as to study these bones a great deal in here. And uh, perhaps you'd catch this tendon running over there. Uh, the minute I run these lines over there, you see, they'll, they'll tell you about the direction of the form. Uh, they'll tell you how things are going. And if you didn't know the way the body of the form was going, you couldn't run those lines. These uh, landmarks here, all artists know those. You see, that one will come there. That's the piece of form bone. There's the flexor. Uh, the thumb has its individuality, I suppose, but uh, uh, you know a good deal about it. And we now know that we have this big mound here, uh, and we know that in this position, uh, it has these very startling wrinkles over it that uh, are all going this way, you see. <coughs> Palmaris brevis, we always feel down here, as a kind of a lonely thing, you know. The uh, life line is in there. And it's just, it's just memory I'm afraid from now on. Uh, of course, at the risk, uh, there's no doubt we'd probably talk about that one, which is this one. 
uh, uh, oh, undoubtedly about this. And then about the long muscle of the palm, you see, that's the one that takes the outline there. Never quite in the middle, a little towards the pisiform bone. And as you study them, they get easier, especially if you mass them up a bit, you know, and feel their direction. Uh, I, I think one of the most startling examples of mass is that little thing I may have done in the beginning. Uh, I can draw a finger like this. But I have to know which way it's going, don't you see? And if I haven't been taught to square up as an artist, and the minute I square up, of course, I put it in blocks, then I can tell which way it's going, you see? Especially if I put a nail there. And I can take just the same old thing and I can square up this way. And then where would I be? Underneath the finger, you see? You see, this one is that, and this one is that. And uh, that's why you find instructors are always telling you to square up, for one of the reasons. The other is to remind you of the two major planes. Uh, but you have to learn to do it the whole body, and it seems to me the only time you can do it is in the art schools, you know, because those are construction lines. And you don't want to mess your drawings up with them after you grow up, you see. Uh, so uh, get them so they're second nature, this squaring up. Of course, they're directly related to perspective as well, you know. <coughs> well, as I say, here I go talking about techniques, 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 but we have to remember, we have to remember that uh, there are many other things in art besides techniques. And somebody once said, Mine eyes have missed the glory of the coming of the Lord. I was searching through my pockets where my visual aids were stored. You see, that shows you what techniques get you. Uh, we have to get these techniques so that they are subconscious and automatic and do not overwhelm us with their importance. Because as artists, we're not really deeply interested in them themselves. We're interested in other things, and it's very hard to say what these other things are. And uh, people take a try. Uh, T.S. Eliot said you had to hear the mermaids singing if you were going to be an artist. And as some of you know, T. Eliot wrote a poem, T.S. Eliot, which went, I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hairs of the waves blown back when the winds blow the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea with sea girls wreathed in seaweed, red and brown. Then human voices wake us and we drown. Thank you. just seen Robert Beverly Hale's lecture number eight on the hand, one of ten lectures on figure drawing and artistic anatomy. We hope you'll join us for the next lecture in the series, lecture number nine on the head. This is Don Holden at the Art Students League of New York.